Hello, my wonderful Matt. I uh, give this caveat at the beginning of every recording because I have no idea what I'm doing. Things change every time I try to do it. It's all a giant vat of fuckery. So if this doesn't sound good, let me know and I'll redo it. And I understand you're going to be out of town. So testing, testing, one, two, three, testing, testing, bumblebee, testing, testing, all day long we sing the testing, testing song. Hopefully that's, oh, this is not showing up great for me on here. Alrighty. From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, this is a Headache Soul production. Welcome to Just the Tipsters, America's favorite true crime podcast, and I'm your host, Melissa Morgan. This is going to be a little different episode. Uh, we're going to have an intro from Angelique explaining why she isn't participating in this episode. And I'll be honest, I'm not even sure I want her to ever hear this one, but she wanted to explain why I'm covering it. Um, she is a sensitive soul and, you know, sometimes the details of these cases are pretty terrible. And if it's someone that you know and love or knew and loved, it's even more terrible. So Anjali had told me about her best friend from college and that he had been murdered. And she was very uh, not wanting to discuss the details, which I understood. So she, I said, may I, I asked her several times, may I cover his case? And, you know, she said, sure. I wanted to make sure she was comfortable with me covering it because, you know, some people can handle these things and some people cannot. Obviously, most of the tipsters can because if you're listening, you can handle it. it it's a different thing, you know, when it's someone you know. It, it has to be a different thing. I never met Will Sarazon, and yet it was a different thing for me because he was a man from my area and because I empathized with his wife so much and a family member killing him, you know. And... I will tell you the difference in getting 11 years, which he will serve half of, Daniel Sarazon, I mean, and Wallach Thomas, the murderer of Kenny Tuttle, being at first given the death penalty, and I, I'm guessing it's been commuted to life without a possibility of parole from what I've been able to find out. It's, n none of it's good. None of it's good. I, I don't have the answer why one person's life is, you know, I don't have any other way to put it except less important than another one's. It, it, it comes down to state by state. And I have debated this with friends who are much smarter than I am, including Angelique, who said, you know, it can't be a across the board kind of sentencing and across the entire country. And I'm like, yeah, I wish it could. I mean, I guess I understand, but I wish it could because you know, I'm not, I'm really not like that whole kumbaya kind of thing, but I do believe we are all one. And if one of us is murdered, all of us suffer. And, you know, I don't, I, I, I know it's going to take a much bigger brain than I have to understand why we can't have more, a more cohesive judicial system even just jurisdictions between police officers. That's starting at the, at the grassroots level. That's the one that bothers me tremendously. Um, I know a lot of law enforcement agencies work together and a lot don't. So uh, that's, that's just the beginning. But, you know, having something punishable by death in one state and punishable by 11 years in another, I, I don't know. So I've been thinking a lot about good and evil, and I have my own theories, and I know all of you wonderful tipsters have your own theories, whether it is um, influenced by religion or, you know, your upbringing or just an intrinsic feeling inside of yourself, I am a very black and white human being. And I believe the world is so much more gray 
than I ever want it to be. I want it to be black and white. I want it to be a clear line between good and evil and and have things explained. And I just can't, I can't get there yet. I had an interesting discussion with someone in law enforcement who said he believes we all know what is, he, he calls it right and wrong. He believes we all know what is right and what is wrong and we make a choice. And I, I tend to agree with that. You know, even that isn't as black and white as I would like it to be. But he believes we all come into this world, you know, whether it's our parents teach us or we have that inside ourselves, you know, we know what's right and wrong and we can choose. And and there's, I do believe that's a large part of it. I also, I don't care if you think I'm, you know, ignorant. I believe man is inherently good. I believe man is inherently good. I do not believe that man is a big wide swath of wrong or bad or I just I think man is inherently good I see it way too often more times a day than I can explain and maybe it's a choice maybe it is a choice but this case is so disturbing for so many reasons it's a cautionary tale it makes you sad that someone who has an open heart and would help someone else was murdered for his kindness. And it's not ignorance, it's kindness. He was a a kind man who thought he was doing someone a favor. So before we get to Kenny's case that, you know, I am so grateful that Angelique told me about it and is comfortable enough with me covering it, I wanted to say a Thank you so much to Tipster Stephanie, who sent a lovely comment on YouTube um, about episode 226, where I said I was considering not continuing the podcast because I'd wrapped up Will Sarazon's case and I just wasn't sure, you know, if I should go forward. I also uh, got a kick in the ass from Tipster Jerry. And he said, stop that shit talk right now. And what's hilarious to me is that Tipster Jerry says um, that will not be tolerated by the Tipster Nation, which is hilarious because the Tipster Nation includes Jerry and I. That's pretty much it. We're the entire nation. But beautiful Tipster Stephanie said, I'm so happy you decided to continue the podcast. You're a strong woman and inspiration. Your unique content and style is like no other. Combined with your remarkable vocabulary and sassy wit, (laughs) <laughs> has shot this podcast to my new favorite, Keep Being You. And that's incredibly kind, Stephanie. I, you can, you know, I don't know that I'm an inspiration or even very strong at this point in my life, but thank you for seeing me that way. And anyone who compliments my vocabulary, you are now my new best friend. It's the second review in a couple of weeks where someone said something nice about my vocabulary, which is makes me laugh because I don't know that my vocabulary is any more polished than any other podcast host. But thank you for hearing me and seeing me that way. It is a, it's a gift. And I also want to say that we are going to have a sponsor soon. And I'm very excited about it. After all, you know, these episodes, all this time with no sponsor, someone reached out and I took a very long time to say yes, because it's an unusual it's not unusual. Uh, it's uh, it's heard everywhere. You're gonna you're gonna know this product, heard and seen everywhere. But I'm kind of excited about it, and uh, I can't say much more, or I will give it away. But let's just say, I'm excited about the sponsor because it's it's very fun and tongue in cheek, and uh, it's I think it's very appropriate for this podcast. So that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks. I'm very excited about that. So you're going to hear an intro from Angelique describing her friendship with Kenny and how close they are even now, very connected. Um, Whether you believe in an afterlife or a past life or a spirituality or anything like that, you know, I know 
Angelique and Kenny are still connected. And it's her love for him and willingness to keep his memory alive that I think is going to keep that that connection. And I am honored to cover his case. And I am just so sorry that I ever have to talk about cases like this and especially something like this because you can just feel what an amazing young man Kenny Kenny was. So Angelique and Kenny had met in college. I believe that's covered in the intro. They were both broadcasting students and Kenny was a full-time employee at American Express and he lived in a, a rental home on Holden. It was a Holden Drive in Greensboro, North Carolina. And he had a roommate, which you'll you'll hear. Honestly, the best information I've gotten is from his murderer um, trying to get the conviction overturned. And the North Carolina Supreme Court did a beautiful reporting of why the sentence was going to remain. And I don't know why it, it has changed, but I do know he's never getting out. I did want Angelique to know that because I think she believes he got out or it was overturned. What I believe was overturned was the death penalty, but he's never getting out. And that is the current information. So this information is from a 1996 article from greensboro.com. And it says, the relatives of victim Kenny Dale Tuttle say they're pleased with the sentence, but that in the larger sense, the justice system let them down. Jurors sentenced a Greensboro man to death Friday in the killing of a UNCG student who was tied up and stabbed 36 times in his kitchen last fall. Relatives of the victim, Kenny Dale Tuttle, said they're glad that Wallet Thomas was sentenced to death and they praised the law enforcement officials who worked on the case. But in a larger sense, the Stokes County residents said they feel the justice system let them down. And you'll understand why. They know that if defendant Wallach Christopher Thomas had served his full sentence in a previous stabbing attack, he wouldn't have been free last fall when Tuttle was killed. I wish they'd taken care of him before it got to this, Moni Johnson. Moni Johnson, Tuttle's aunt, said, I'm glad it ended this way, but Kenny is still dead. Kenneth Tuttle Sr., the victim's father, was also pleased with the verdict, but he wasn't celebrating. It's the best we can do, but it's still so unfair. Thomas will join five other people from Guilford County on death row. 155 people throughout North Carolina are awaiting death sentences. Guilford Public Defender Wally Harrison said the sentence will be appealed, and it was. Jurors deliberated for a little more than two hours Thursday afternoon and Friday morning before returning their decision. On Wednesday, it took them a little more than two hours to find Thomas guilty of first-degree murder in the case. Tuttle, 27, was killed on September 11, 1995. Prosecutors argued that Thomas went to Tuttle's house on Holden Road at 1 a.m., knocked on the door, and asked Tuttle to call him a cab. The senior Tuttle described his son as the kind of person who would open his door for a stranger who seemed to need help. He was just a good person. I'm sure the guy told him his car was broken down. Once Thomas got inside, he tied Tuttle's hands behind his back and used a stuffed animal and aprons to gag him, said District Attorney Dick Panache. Twenty minutes later, when the cab showed up, Thomas sent the driver away. He then went to the kitchen where Tuttle was tied up and stabbed him to death. Panache said Thomas, 30 at the time, then stole a TV stereo and Tuttle's clothes, his wallet, and his car. <sighs> During the final arguments in the death penalty hearing, Panache told jurors that Thomas is an arrogant, brutal killer. He urged them to sentence Thomas to death. Remember, you're the voice and conscience of the community, Panache said. It's your responsibility to make sure that Wallach Christopher Thomas never does this again to another person. Defense attorneys asked the jury to show mercy and sentence Thomas to life. They said Thomas suffered as a child because he saw his mother beaten by his father and then by another man whom she later married. 
Members of the jury, death is final, said Harrelson, who was one of two defense attorneys in the case. What can you live with for the remainder of your life? Yeah. On Friday morning, Thomas showed no emotion as the verdict was read. Later, as deputies walked him out of the courtroom, he turned to his attorney and said, I'll be back. So a beautiful, kind, thoughtful, responsible, creative, 27-year-old man, senselessly murdered by a 30-year-old man because of his kindness. So what I'm going to read to you is basically the case laid out by the North Carolina Supreme Court. And they, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a legal brief, but it's, it's well written and it explains how and why the state made their case. On October 2nd of 1995, Wallach Thomas was indicted for first degree murder. On February 16th of 1996, he was also indicted for first degree burglary, robbery with a dangerous weapon, first degree kidnapping. He was tried capitally on the 22nd of July, 1996. The jury found the defendant guilty of first degree murder on the basis of premeditation and deliberation and under the felony murder rule. The jury also found the defendant guilty of first-degree burglary, robbery with a dangerous weapon, and first-degree kidnapping. Following a separate capital sentencing proceeding, the jury recommends a sentence of death for the first-degree murder. And you're going to find out what the other sentence was because he shouldn't have been out. He should not have been out and had the opportunity to kill Kenny or anyone else. He should have still been incarcerated. The state's evidence shows that defendant Wallet Christopher Thomas entered the home of the victim, Kenneth Dale Tuttle Jr., bound and gagged him, robbed him, and stabbed him to death. Kenneth Dale Tuttle Jr., bound and gagged. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that. On the evening of the 10th of September of 1995, the defendant asked Carmichael Wilson to give him a ride so that he could get some money from his supervisor. Wilson had his friend, William Thomas Warren, also known as Rabbit, drive them to where the defendant wanted to go. Rabbit parked his car on a side street around the corner from the intersection of Spring Garden Road and Holden Road in Greensboro. While Wilson and Rabbit waited in the car, Defendant Thomas walked to J.P. Looney's, a sports bar located at the same intersection. A bartender working that light, a bartender working that night, later identified the defendant as the man who came into the bar sometime around midnight and asked for free food. Several times, Wilson went in to check on the defendant, who assured him that he would have some money soon. Finally, at approximately 1.30 a.m., Wilson talked to the bartender who told him that the defendant, Wallach Thomas, had left the bar a short time before. On that same night, Kenneth Tuttle went to the home of a friend to watch a football game. At 11.30 p.m., Tuttle left the friend's house to return to his own home at 707 South Holden Road, a few hundred yards from J.P. Looney's. At 1.41 a.m. on September 11th, 1995, a dispatcher for the Daniel Keck Cab Company received a call requesting a taxi come to Tuttle's address. The dispatcher testified that the caller called a second time to find out why the cab had not arrived. At 2.10, a driver was dispatched to 707 South Holden Road. The driver testified that when he arrived, no one came outside but he noticed a light blue or gray car parked in the driveway. At 4.30 a.m., Tuttle's roommate arrived home. As he was starting to open the back door, he looked through the window and saw Tuttle on the floor against the door. The roommate went to a neighbor's house and called the police. The first officer on the scene determined that Tuttle was dead. Tuttle was found with a towel, a rag, 
and a stuffed animal tied around his head and an apron tied around his feet and his hands tied behind his back with a telephone cord. An autopsy revealed he had bled to death from 36 stab wounds to his neck, chest, and abdominal area, most of which were inflicted while Kenneth Tuttle was still alive. According to the testimony of <laughs> According to the testimony of Dr. Thomas Clark, the Chief Medical Examiner's Office, Tuttle's wounds could have been inflicted by a butcher knife. Tuttle's roommate went through the house and discovered several items of personal property were missing, including two knives from a knife block in the kitchen. Tuttle's clothing, a television set, a stereo, and Tuttle's wallet. Also missing was Tuttle's car, a silver-gray Nissan Sentra. One of the prints lifted from the stove door handle in the home was later determined to have been made by the left palm of the defendant. The investigating officer also found a telephone book open to taxicab pages and an ice tray and plastic cup next to the kitchen sink. After Wilson had returned to his house on Martin Luther King Drive, he saw the defendant, who only lived two houses away from him, arrive in a car. The defendant told Wilson that his supervisor had let him keep the car and that his supervisor had also given him the clothes which were in the car. The defendant asked Wilson to help him carry the clothes upstairs to the defendant's room. Wilson then drove with the defendant to a bank where the defendant was videotaped attempting to withdraw cash using Tuttle's automatic teller machine card at 4.20 a.m. on September 11, 1995. While waiting in the car, Wilson noticed a wallet containing a white man's driver's license on the seat. On September 11, 1995, a member of the Greensboro Police Department stopped Shamba Wynn while he was driving Tuttle's car on Julian Street. James Harold Edwards testified that he saw the defendant give the keys to the stolen car to win. Edwards directed the officers to the defendant's address at 707 Martin Luther King Drive. When the police knocked, the defendant answered. Defendant gave his consent for a search of his room. On a couch, officers found a stack of men's clothing still on hangers. These clothes were later identified as belonging to Kenneth Tuttle. The defendant was arrested. At the time of his arrest, the defendant was wearing a shirt and a pair of pants belonging to Kenneth Tuttle. The stereo and television set stolen from Tuttle's house were later recovered from a crack house where Wilson testified he had gone with defendant Thomas. Defendant testified on his own behalf, admitting that he had been to Tuttle's home with Wilson and Rabbit on the night of the murder. According to the defendant, Wilson came to him, asking for a ride to a white dude's house to settle a drug debt. The defendant testified that when he left the house with Rabbit, Wilson stayed behind and Tuttle was still alive. So here he is throwing his friend under the bus for the murder of Kenneth Tuttle. The state relied on the testimony of Mary Blue, and this is the part that is heartbreaking in so many ways that if this could have been adjudicated correctly, maybe Kenny Tuttle would still be alive. The state relied on the testimony of Mary Blue, who'd been assaulted and robbed by the defendant after he tricked his way into her house to establish the defendant's modus operandi. She testified that the defendant rang her doorbell, asked to use the phone to get help because his car had broken down. 
Once inside the kitchen, he asked for a telephone book and a glass of water. In the present case, the defendant testified to being in the victim's kitchen to drink a glass of water. The police found a telephone book open to the taxi cab pages. A cab company had received a call at about the time of the murder, requesting that a cab come to the victim's address. Ms. Blue testified that the defendant had stabbed her in the neck with a knife taken from her kitchen. In the present case, Tuttle was stabbed in the neck with a knife taken from his own kitchen. Finally, in both offenses, the victim's wallet or pocketbook was stolen. Viewed in the light most favorable to the state, this evidence permitted the inference that the defendant tricked his way into Tuttle's house in the same manner that he tricked his way into Mrs. Mary Blue's house. In addition, there was other in addition, there was other evidence that the defendant had been inside Tuttle's residence. Defendant testified he did not know Tuttle, but that he had been in his home. Defendant testified that he had been in the kitchen because he asked Tuttle for a drink of water. And defendant's palm print was found on the stove in the kitchen. Therefore, we conclude that there is sufficient evidence of a constructive breaking to sustain defendant's burglary conviction. We overrule that this was an assignment of error. Moreover, the state presented evidence tending to show that Tuttle was home at the time that the defendant broke in and entered his residence. Tuttle left his friend's house at 11.30 p.m. The cab driver testified when he arrived at Tuttle's home after 2 a.m., there was a blue or gray car in the driveway, which was later determined to be Kenny Tuttle's car. When Tuttle's roommate returned home later that morning and discovered that Tuttle's body, when Tuttle's roommate returned home later that morning and discovered Tuttle's body, he did notice that Tuttle's car was gone. All of this evidence tended to show that Tuttle was actually occupying his residence when the defendant broke into the victim's home and entered it to rob and murder him. In light of the foregoing evidence, we conclude that the defendant cannot show that the jury probably would have reached a different verdict even if the trial court had instructed it even if the trial court had instructed it on the lesser included offense of second degree <sighs> even if the trial court had instructed it on the lesser included offense of second degree burglary this assignment of error is also meritless Next, the defendant contends that the trial court committed reversible error in failing to properly instruct the jury on the probative value of fingerprint or palm print evidence. As to how his left palm print came to be on the stove in the victim's kitchen, the defendant testified he'd been inside the victim's house the night of the murder. He said he had impressed his palm on the stove when he went into the kitchen to get a glass of water, but when he left, the victim was still alive. This case has several features which distinguish it from the cases in which we have found the death sentence to be disproportionate. First, the jury found the defendant guilty of first-degree murder under theories of both premeditation and deliberation and felony murder. We have noted the significance of a first-degree murder conviction based upon both premeditation and deliberation and felony murder theories. See State v. Harris. Second, the evidence tended to show that the victim was brutally stabbed in his own home. This court has consistent this court has consistently emphasized that murder committed in the home particularly shocks the conscience because such murders involve the violation of an especially private place where a person has a right to feel secure. Further, the evidence tended to show that the defendant repeatedly stabbed the victim while he was bound and helpless and while he was still conscious. Moreover, in none of the cases in which the death penalty was found to be disproportionate was an aggravating circumstance found. The jury's finding of the prior conviction of a felon at f the jury's finding of the prior conviction of a violent felony aggravating circumstance is significant and finding a death sentence proportionate. Based on the characteristics of this defendant and the crime he committed, we're convinced the sentence of death was neither excessive nor disproportionate. We therefore conclude that the defendant received a fair trial 
and capital sentencing proceeding free of prejudicial error and that the judgment of death recommended by the jury and entered by the trial court must be left undisturbed. And that is from Chief Justice Mitchell. Now, trying to find anything I could find about this case, it was not easy. But I can tell you, Wallach Christopher Thomas is still incarcerated in the central prison in North Carolina. He is offender number 0405380. He is an active inmate. His eligibility for probation, parole, or post-release is inactive. He is a male of black or African-American race. He was born on June 25th of 1966. So he is now 55 years old. So he has spent 25 years in prison, and I tried, I didn't want Anjali, and she knows the details, she's trying hard to block them out. I wanted her to know, she thought that his conviction had been overturned, but what it looks like was overturned was the death penalty, and that could be because of the state. I don't know, I can't find out, I can't find the information I want about that, and I've looked and looked and looked for several weeks now, but at least I found that he is still incarcerated. He has no eligibility for parole or probation. And I think it's a good thing that someone like him stays there forever because he is, you know, as the DA said, a, an arrogant and brutal murderer. He is an arrogant and brutal murderer. For what? For a television, some clothing, a car he gave to someone else, I don't, I'm still, I'm still juggling good and evil in my head. And this would obviously fall under the guise of evil, but I don't know. It's more than that. It's a choice. It's a choice to be a monster. There's just no other word. The fact that Mary Blue didn't die from, you know, the first attack, and who knows how many more there were. You know, he got arrested because she lived, and he got arrested so soon after Kenny died because he's arrogant is one word. I would say ignorant. I mean, he just didn't care. Cavalier cavalier with someone's life, a good person, a good member of the community, a a best friend to Angelique. I don't, I don't know. I don't understand and I'm not ever gonna. And the only thing I can say is that, you know, I'm grateful to Angelique for letting me talk about Kenny's case because it's extremely painful for her. And she took a lot of time telling me about it little bit by little bit because it was so difficult for her to talk about. And I am grateful to her because if we continue to talk about these cases and honoring someone's life who should still be with us for all intents and purposes should still be alive, I feel like it contributes something positive to the world whether it's comes wrapped in a a dark charcoal gray blanket, the blanket being Wallach Thomas, I feel like if we can throw that blanket off and let the light shine out, the Wallach Thomases of the world, you know, maybe their blankets will dry up and blow away because we need to remember the Kenny Tuttles of the world who shown a light that made Angelique's life so happy and many other people, I'm sure, and roll up the blankets and kick them to the curb because there's no need. There's no need in this. There was, you know, one of my favorite things I heard this week is a detective who said, when someone asks me, what is the motive? It's simple. The motive is murder. 
And that's the truth. You can say the motive was robbery, but it wasn't even, it wasn't even. <laughs> it was, it was not. It was that Wallach Thomas, and I don't give a shit about the mitigation package that his, you know, defense attorneys tried to present that he had seen his mother beaten. The life journey of a human being is traumatic. We mostly, most of us, see terrible, awful, traumatic things, go through them ourselves, and we make the choice not to do things like this, irrevocable things that change so many lives. And now I just sound like I'm yelling on the top of a bandstand, and I just, I, I know I, I need to shut up. The important part here is that we remember that Kenny Tuttle was a good, kind man, and I am so sad that in the mid-90s, when maybe things felt a little safer, and you lived in a, a southern town that you could open your door and offer someone your phone because their car broke down or a glass of water. I'm sorry that that kindness was returned in such an awful way, but I'm still grateful for the Kenny Tuttles of the world and the people who are good and kind because I do see it every day. I see it every day, many more times than I see awful shit like this. So I'm still going to choose to believe that man is good. I'm still going to do that. I'm still going to do that. And if you have a tip on a missing person or an unsolved homicide, or you just want to suggest a case, please give us a call at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837. You can email us at jttipsters at gmail.com or on any of the social media platforms. Just the Tipsters Facebook page, JT Tipsters at Instagram, JT Tipsters Pod on Twitter, and more cowbell.